The Sixth Amendment, Amendment v. to the United States Constitution is the part of the United States Bill of Rights that sets forth rights related to criminal prosecutions. The Supreme Court has applied the protections of this amendment to the states through the Due Process Clause of the Fourteenth Amendment. Text In all criminal prosecutions, the accused shall enjoy the right to a speedy and public trial, by an impartial jury of the state and district wherein the crime shall have been committed, which district shall have been previously ascertained by law, and to be informed of the nature and cause of the accusation, to be confronted with the witnesses against him, to have compulsory process for obtaining witnesses in his favor, and to have the assistance of counsel for his defense. Rights secured <inaudible> Speedy trial Criminal defendants have the right to a speedy trial. In Barker v. Wingo, 407 U.S. 514 1972, the Supreme Court laid down a four-part case-by-case balancing test for determining whether the defendant's speedy trial right has been violated. The four factors are Length of delay. A delay of a year or more from the date on which the speedy trial right attaches. The date of arrest or indictment, whichever first occurs, was termed presumptively prejudicial, but the court has never explicitly ruled that any absolute time limit applies. Reason for the delay. The prosecution may not excessively delay the trial for its own advantage, but a trial may be delayed to secure the presence of an absent witness or other practical considerations e.g., change of venue. Time and manner in which the defendant has asserted his right. If a defendant agrees to the delay when it works to his own benefit, he cannot later claim that he has been unduly delayed. Degree of prejudice to the defendant which the delay has caused, in Strunk v. United States, 412 U.S. 434 1973, the Supreme Court ruled that if the reviewing court finds that a defendant's right to a speedy trial was violated, then the indictment must be dismissed and or the conviction overturned. The court held that, since the delayed trial is the state action which violates the defendant's rights, no other remedy would be appropriate. Thus, a reversal or dismissal of a criminal case on speedy trial grounds means that no further prosecution for the alleged offense can take place. Public trial In Shepard v. Maxwell, 384 U.S. 333 1966, the Supreme Court ruled that the right to a public trial is not absolute. In cases where excess publicity would serve to undermine the defendant's right to due process, limitations can be put on public access to the proceedings. According to Press Enterprise Co., v. Superior Court, 478 U.S. 1, 1986, trials can be closed at the behest of the government if there is an overriding interest based on findings that closure is essential to preserve higher values and is narrowly tailored to serve that interest. The accused may also request a closure of the trial, though, it must be demonstrated that first, there is a substantial probability that the defendant's right to a fair trial will be prejudiced by publicity that closure would prevent, and second, reasonable alternatives to closure cannot adequately protect the defendant's right to a fair trial. <laughs> Impartial jury The right to a jury has always depended on the nature of the offense with which the defendant is charged. Petty offenses—those punishable by imprisonment for no more than six months—are not covered by the jury requirement. Even where multiple petty offenses are concerned, the total time of imprisonment possibly exceeding six months, the right to a jury trial does not exist. Also, in the United States, except for serious offenses such as murder, minors are usually tried in a juvenile court, which lessens the sentence allowed, but forfeits the right to a jury. Originally, the Supreme Court held that the Sixth Amendment right to a jury trial indicated a right to a trial by jury as understood and applied at common law, and includes all the essential elements as they were recognized in this country and England when the Constitution was adopted. Therefore, it was held that juries had to be composed of twelve persons and that verdicts had to be unanimous, as was customary in England. 
When, under the Fourteenth Amendment, the Supreme Court extended the right to a trial by jury to defendants in state courts, it re-examined some of the standards. It has been held that twelve came to be the number of jurors by historical accident, and that a jury of six would be sufficient, but anything less would deprive the defendant of a right to trial by jury. The Sixth Amendment mandates unanimity in a federal jury trial. However, the Supreme Court has ruled that the Due Process Clause of the Fourteenth Amendment, while requiring states to provide jury trials for serious crimes, does not incorporate all the elements of a jury trial within the meaning of the Sixth Amendment. Thus, states are not mandated to require jury unanimity, unless the jury has only six members. Impartiality The Sixth Amendment requires juries to be impartial. Impartiality has been interpreted as requiring individual jurors to be unbiased. At voir dire, each side may question potential jurors to determine any bias, and challenge them if the same is found. The court determines the validity of these challenges for cause. Defendants may not challenge a conviction because a challenge for cause was denied incorrectly if they had the opportunity to use peremptory challenges. In Peña Rodriguez v. Colorado 2017, the Supreme Court ruled that the Sixth Amendment requires a court in a criminal trial to investigate whether a jury's guilty verdict was based on racial bias. For a guilty verdict to be set aside based on the racial bias of a juror, the defendant must prove that the racial bias was a significant motivating factor in the juror's vote to convict. <laughs> Veneer of juries Another factor in determining the impartiality of the jury is the nature of the panel, or veneer, from which the jurors are selected. Veneers must represent a fair cross section of the community. The defendant might establish that the requirement was violated by showing that the allegedly excluded group is a distinctive one in the community, that the representation of such a group in veneers is unreasonable and unfair in regard to the number of persons belonging to such a group, and that the under-representation is caused by a systematic exclusion in the selection process. Thus, in Taylor v. Louisiana, 419 U.S. 522 1975, the Supreme Court invalidated a state law that exempted women who had not made a declaration of willingness to serve from jury service, while not doing the same for men. Topic. Sentencing In Apprendi v. New Jersey, 530 U.S. 466 2000, and Blakely v. Washington, 542 U.S. 296 2004, the Supreme Court ruled that a criminal defendant has a right to a jury trial not only on the question of guilt or innocence, but also regarding any fact used to increase the defendant's sentence beyond the maximum otherwise allowed by statutes or sentencing guidelines. In Aline v. United States, 11-9335 2013, the court expanded on Apprendi and Blakely by ruling that a defendant's right to a jury applies to any fact that would increase a defendant's sentence beyond the minimum otherwise required by statute. Vicinage <inaudible> 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 Article 3, Section 2 of the Constitution requires defendants be tried by juries and in the state in which the crime was committed. The Sixth Amendment requires the jury to be selected from judicial districts ascertained by statute. In Beavers v. Henkel, 194 U.S. 73 1904, the Supreme Court ruled that the place where the offense is charged to have occurred determines a trial's location. Where multiple districts are alleged to have been locations of the crime, any of them may be chosen for the trial. In cases of offenses not committed in any state, for example, offenses committed at sea, the place of trial may be determined by the Congress. Topic: <laughs> Notice of accusation. A criminal defendant has the right to be informed of the nature and cause of the accusation against him. Therefore, an indictment must allege all the ingredients of the crime to such a degree of precision that it would allow the accused to assert double jeopardy if the same charges are brought up in subsequent prosecution. The Supreme Court held in United States v. Carl, 105 U.S. 611, 1881, that, in an indictment, 
it is not sufficient to set forth the offence in the words of the statute, unless those words of themselves fully, directly, and expressly, without any uncertainty or ambiguity, set forth all the elements necessary to constitute the offence intended to be punished." Vague wording, even if taken directly from a statute, does not suffice. However, the government is not required to hand over written copies of the indictment free of charge. Topic. Confrontation The Confrontation Clause relates to the common law rule preventing the admission of hearsay, that is to say, testimony by one witness as to the statements and observations of another person to prove that the statement or observation was accurate. The rationale was that the defendant had no opportunity to challenge the credibility of and cross-examine the person making the statements. Certain exceptions to the hearsay rule have been permitted, for instance, admissions by the defendant are admissible, as are dying declarations. Nevertheless, in California v. Green, 399 U.S. 149 1970, the Supreme Court has held that the hearsay rule is not the same as the Confrontation Clause. Hearsay is admissible under certain circumstances. For example, in Bruton v. United States, 391 U.S. 123 1968, the Supreme Court ruled that while a defendant's out-of-court statements were admissible in proving the defendant's guilt, they were inadmissible hearsay against another defendant. Hearsay may, in some circumstances, be admitted though it is not covered by one of the long-recognized exceptions. For example, prior testimony may sometimes be admitted if the witness is unavailable. However, in Crawford v. Washington, 541 U.S. 36 2004, the Supreme Court increased the scope of the Confrontation Clause by ruling that testimonial out-of-court statements are inadmissible if the accused did not have the opportunity to cross-examine that accuser and that accuser is unavailable at trial. In Davis v. Washington 547 U.S. 813 2006, the court ruled that testimonial refers to any statement that an objectively reasonable person in the declarant's situation would believe likely to be used in court. In Melendez-Diaz v. Massachusetts, 557 U.S. underscore 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 2009, and Bullcoming v. New Mexico, 564 U.S. underscore 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 2011, the court ruled that admitting a lab chemist's analysis into evidence, without having him testify, violated the confrontation clause. In Michigan v. Bryant, 562 U.S. underscore 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 2011, the court ruled that the primary purpose of a shooting victim's statement as to who shot him, and the police's reason for questioning him, each had to be objectively determined. If the primary purpose was for dealing with an ongoing emergency, then any such statement was not testimonial and so the confrontation clause would not require the person making that statement to testify in order for that statement to be admitted into evidence. The right to confront and cross-examine witnesses also applies to physical evidence. The prosecution must present physical evidence to the jury, providing the defense ample opportunity to cross-examine its validity and meaning. Prosecution generally may not refer to evidence without first presenting it. In the late 20th and early 21st century this clause became an issue in the use of the silent witness rule. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Compulsory process. The compulsory process clause gives any criminal defendant the right to call witnesses in his favor. If any such witness refuses to testify, that witness may be compelled to do so by the court at the request of the defendant. However, in some cases the court may refuse to permit a defense witness to testify. For example, if a defense lawyer fails to notify the prosecution of the identity of a witness to gain a tactical advantage, that witness may be precluded from testifying. Topic: <laughs> Assistance of counsel. A criminal defendant has the right to be represented by counsel. In Powell v. Alabama, 287 U.S. 45 1932, the Supreme Court ruled that, "...in a capital case, where the defendant is unable to employ counsel, and is incapable adequately of making his own defense because of ignorance, feeble-mindedness, illiteracy, or the like, it is the duty of the court, whether requested or not, to assign counsel for him." In Johnson v. 
Zerbst, 304 U.S. 458 1938, the Supreme Court ruled that in all federal cases, counsel would have to be appointed for defendants who were too poor to hire their own. In 1961, the court extended the rule that applied in federal courts to state courts. It held in Hamilton v. Alabama, 368 U.S. 52 1961, that counsel had to be provided at no expense to defendants in capital cases when they so requested, even if there was no ignorance, feeble-mindedness, illiteracy, or the like. Gideon v. Wainwright, 372 U.S. 335 1963, ruled that counsel must be provided to indigent defendants in all felony cases, overruling Betts v. Brady, 316 U.S. 455 1942, in which the court ruled that state courts had to appoint counsel only when the defendant demonstrated special circumstances requiring the assistance of counsel. Under Argersinger v. Hamlin, 407 U.S. 25 1972, counsel must be appointed in any case resulting in a sentence of actual imprisonment. Regarding sentences not immediately leading to imprisonment, the court in Scott v. Illinois, 440 U.S. 367 1979, ruled that counsel did not need to be appointed, but in Alabama v. Shelton, 535 U.S. 654 2002, the court held that a suspended sentence that may result in incarceration cannot be imposed if the defendant did not have counsel at trial. As stated in Brewer v. Williams, 430 U.S. 387 1977, the right to counsel means at least that a person is entitled to the help of a lawyer at or after the time that judicial proceedings have been initiated against him, whether by formal charge, preliminary hearing, indictment, information, or arraignment." Brewer goes on to conclude that once adversary proceedings have begun against a defendant, he has a right to legal representation when the government interrogates him and that when a defendant is arrested, arraigned on an arrest warrant before a judge, and committed by the court to confinement. T. Here can be no doubt that judicial proceedings have been initiated. <laughs> Self-representation A criminal defendant may represent himself, unless a court deems the defendant to be incompetent to waive the right to counsel. In Ferretta v. California, 422 U.S. 806 1975, the Supreme Court recognized a defendant's right to pro se representation. However, under Godinez v. Moran, 509 U.S. 389 1993, a court that believes the defendant is less than fully competent to represent himself can require that defendant to be represented by counsel. In Martinez v. Court of Appeal of California, 528 U.S. 152 2000, the Supreme Court ruled the right to pro se representation did not apply to appellate courts. In Indiana v. Edwards, 554 U.S. 164 2008, the court ruled that a criminal defendant could be simultaneously competent to stand trial, but not competent to represent himself. In Bounds v. Smith, 430 U.S. 817 1977, the Supreme Court held that the constitutional right of meaningful access to the courts can be satisfied by counsel or access to legal materials. Bounds has been interpreted by several United States Courts of Appeals to mean a pro se defendant does not have a constitutional right to access a prison law library to research his defense when access to the courts has been provided through appointed counsel. See also Trial in absentia United States Constitutional Criminal Procedure